and welcome. You're listening to Sarah Cudmore from Homegrown Learning's podcasts, sponsored by Collage. And today's podcast is titled Education, What's Happened? And I'm joined by Wendy Tipman. Uh, Wendy has the most extensive library books uh, about education and learning that I have ever seen. Uh, her research and experience and knowledge over the past 40 years has taken her across the globe to change the culture of learning environments. And I'm super grateful that she's agreed to help me share some light on what she thinks has happened to education in England. I'm recording this because of my own personal experiences and thoughts when I started home educating. Um, And I'm hoping that this might empower you as a parent when you come to making decisions about how to educate your child. As you may or may not know, I was a head teacher of a primary school for 20, with 20 years experience. Um, I loved my job, but when I had my own children and they started school, things just felt really different. I started to see things from the child's perspective um, and things just didn't feel right uh, for me. So after a while, I decided to follow my gut feeling and I left the profession. I went on a massive learning curve, my own natural curiosity took took over and I started researching home education. As I did, I uncovered so much about education and learning and what had happened over time. And this gave me great confidence in my decision to home educate. It empowered me with my debate with my family and peers about why I wanted to home educate. So just before we get going, I also wanted to share with you that this is based on our own findings and thoughts and it's certainly not an exhaustive list. We had a job working out who to talk about, as there are so many incredible people that have written about education, learning, and the school system. So one of the questions that I get asked a lot is whether parents have always had the right to send their children to school or not. Well, it's a good question. Um, Tracking it back, the first act legally requiring people to educate their children was actually in 1870 and it was for five to 13 year olds it became compulsory um, to educate children but it doesn't actually say it was compulsory for them to attend a school when it was introduced uh, in parliament earl gray said it was introducing a system by which the means of elementary education may reach every home and be brought within the reach of every child in the country. So in theory, every parent of a child five to 13 had the right to send them to school or not. Mm. And that's mainly because although education was compulsory at the time, schools involved paying fees and schooling wasn't free for another 10 years. So enforcement was actually left up to the local school boards Um, and based on whether education was affordable or not. So it's interesting that for 150 years, it's been up to the parent to decide how they educate their child. Were there schools before then? And and actually, how did schools as we know them um, evolve? Well, the first school is said to be King's School Canterbury, which was founded in 597 AD, can you believe it? (laughs) Uh, Interestingly, it's also the oldest charity in the UK. Beverley Grammar School in East Yorkshire claims to be the oldest state school in England, having been founded in about 700 AD. So over the next thousand years, there were lots of schools all over the country of different types, run on different lines. One of the most common were known as Dame Schools, which existed from probably the 16th century until the 19th in towns and rural areas and they were for young children run by women usually in their own homes for a small fee Mm -hmm. the children were taught the alphabet and reading using the bible because it was the only text that a lot of people had in those days some were said to offer polite education (laughs) to children of wealthier families but they've also been likened to quote no more than poor quality child minding services. Mm. Um, And then there were big changes really with people like Robert Rakes. He opened his first Sunday school in Gloucester in 
which led to a new nationwide system of education. Um, they were places for poor children, taught reading, writing, again, using the Bible as a textbook. Um, and they took place on Sundays because children were working during the week. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, not available to attend school as we know it. But by 1831, it was said that there were 1,250,000 children okay. attending uh, Sunday school, and that was a quarter of the child population. Wow. By 1850, 20-odd years later, 2.5 million children were attending Sunday school, and that was voluntary. That's a big jump. It is. So in addition to Robert Rakes and his uh, Sunday school, there were different sorts of schools. A man called Joseph Lancaster invented what we call the monitorial system, um, which was basically one big room with tiered seating, a bit like a theatre or a lecture theatre. Um, and he used to get the brightest children to teach groups of the least clever children in groups. Um, and the, there was one teacher often in the room only with hundreds sometimes, um, and all these little monitors who were actually teaching children very simple lessons. Um, and there's one left, one model left in Hertfordshire, which is the Bridges Schools Museum. Um, and uh, it's held to be uh, quite a, an important development, I think. And it's stuck, it stuck in different parts of the world because it's spread all over the place. Um, but they talk about it as relegating the curriculum to particles of information and rote learning, mm. uh, where opportunities for creative thinking and initiative hardly existed. Mm. That is fascinating. So I spent my whole life thinking that Victorians were responsible for the rote learning concept in schools, but, but they weren't. No. Um, and this is actually much earlier and has actually been around a long time. Some would say that it's even back in fashion today and maybe it's um, similarly criticised. So we'll come back to this. <laughs> yeah, there's been lots of innovations, um, some really, really good ones and that people will know about, like the first infant school um, that was opened by Robert Owen in New Lanark. He believed that human character is formed by circumstances over which we have no control. So children had to be placed in the right influences in order to develop from their earliest years. And then there was a wonderful man called Samuel Wilderspin, who designed the first purpose-built infant school in England, in Cheltenham, in 1830. He published the first practical handbook on educating young children in 1823 and he was responsible for setting up the Infant School Society in 1824. Wilderspin must have been the most marvellous man. Um, he talks about the fact that as a child he loved learning but he was dismayed uh, by school where he was punished for quotes what the teachers had forgotten to teach me. But most importantly for me, I think, he was the first person to recognise the importance of playgrounds as we know them. Mm -hmm. And all of his schools had designed playgrounds, areas outdoors, where he said that children had to spend at least half their time in school outdoors. Wouldn't that be a great thing today? Um, he opened all together about 150 schools um, and the playgrounds were filled with blocks and things that children could use to create structures, a um, bit like the block play of, of today really. Yeah. Um, and also the engravings that survive show things like the old fashioned witch's hat that we used to see in playgrounds oh, go around and round. Um, he's also credited with creating what was latterly called progressive education. Um, and one of his model schools still exists in Barton on Humberside, where it's been uh, renovated and English Heritage claim it as one of the most important schools in England. Oh. So yeah, meantime, there was um, a bit of a spat going on really in the national system because 
Sunday schools led to the development of what was eventually called the National School Society. Um, it existed to open a school in every parish in England. Um, it was essentially uh, based within the Anglican church system, but there were plenty of opponents, uh, not least the non-conformist mm. groups of uh, Christians who had a different view about the way schools should be run and managed. But between 1811 and 1833, 7,000 schools were built mm. um, or rooms were extended or expanded um, and they claim that the attendance ran into millions of children at that time. Um, you can see them all over the place, actually, because in most cases they had the word national school right. carved across the entrance. Okay. Um, and lots of them have, have survived. The demand, though, for mass literacy really outstripped supply. Um, and the state got involved in 1833 in a way that you probably wouldn't expect because instead of actually involving itself in the education of children it made a grant available of £20,000 to support school buildings which uh, was an interesting development really. Hmm. Um, yeah that's really interesting that the first state intervention wasn't actually about education uh, as such, but the schools that it was taking place in. Um, so it took almost 150 years for the government to introduce a curriculum. Why do you think they needed to introduce one? Well, it's, it's difficult to say. That funding um, led to the establishment of a committee, as ever, and the committee was remitted to look at the way the money was spent. Um, whether they were looking at the way the buildings were built or the teaching in the buildings was carried out, we're not really sure. But very closely after that, the first two school inspectors were appointed. Um, and a couple of years later, the first secretary to the Board of Education uh, was appointed. And that was the first government department responsible for education. Then. It took till 1986 for the government to introduce a national curriculum. Um, and by that time, there were loads and loads of different ideas around curriculum. People talked about a syllabus and they talked about different styles of delivering education. Um, the broad principles were the same, reading, writing and arithmetic. And people talk about the three R's, yes. um, which is it's a bit of a trick for children, I think, to have writing in there under the three R's. Um, but there is a school of thought that the three R's are nothing to do with what we think they're to do with, that actually it's about reading and writing, reckoning and arithmetic, mm. and writing and routing. Never heard of that. No, it's, um, it's interesting that writing and routing were to do with the things we made with our hands. Mm -hmm. So we have wheel rights because they were people that built wheels. So the whole idea mm -hmm. was that we were talking about language, reading, mm -hmm. writing, math, loosely, uh, arithmetic, and things that we do with our hands in order to create, manufacture, develop. Um, and there are people today who say that the worst thing that happened to us that was that routing fell off the, because there's not a word for it either. There isn't a word that married writing and routing. No. And, uh, and it just got dropped. Um, and maybe it's, it's picked up now with IT and DT, but there are people like James Dyson who say that unless we bring back the validity of working with our hands and making things, mm. that our education is lacking. Yeah. Um, and I love that emphasis at the time was on the creative side, like how different that would be if we were still doing that today. The, the last half of the 19th century saw lots of changes, really. Um, people are going to be familiar with things uh, like kindergarten, mm. um, established by Friedrich Froebel, uh, who had a very difficult job 
getting it taken up in Germany, but it became very popular here. Um, and really his education was based on a form of curriculum. It was known as the gifts, and it was a, a plan of the way children were helped to develop their talents. Um, and then of course there was the famous Charlotte Mason, yeah. uh, who in 1886 co-founded the uh, Parents' Education Union um, and wrote a book on home education, probably the first book we yeah. think with that title. Yeah. Um, she believed that children had a natural love of learning, but she talked about them needing to be fed with their best, with the best ideas. Mm. So she had a curriculum of sorts as well. Um, she called it mind food, which I think is a lovely description. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's also interesting to note that, that Charlotte Mason is the first woman to feature in this short and necessary um, incomplete story. Isn't it? It is. Although you do wonder about all those dames mm, that were so actually mean, doing it as opposed to the people that were formulating theories and rules and regulations, most of which it seems at that stage were men. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, and there were other regimes, I suppose, that um, evolved a curriculum of sorts. Uh, one led to the development of the open air school movement, which came here from Germany in 1907. They were amazing places where children with tuberculosis um, consumption, they called it back then, uh, were actually cured. Um, they were taken out of school and they were put in wonderful environments, which were normally in woodland or on parkland. Um, and they had a very, very strict regime because children were washed every morning, they were fed several times a day, their diet was regulated, very heavily controlled, they had sleeps in the afternoon. Um, and interestingly, in London, uh, the open air schools, children were moved to the open air schools in electric carts. Wow. And we think that's a new thing, and of course it isn't. No. Um, but uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, for all sorts of reasons, open air schools, as they were known, uh, more or less disappeared. Margaret Macmillan's concept led to the development of the first training for nursery nurses in the Rachel Macmillan Co College in London. Um, and that was very much based on a very strict regime. Mm. And it was strict in the sense that it gave children freedom. Yeah. So the staff and the adults were very strictly controlled in terms of ensuring that they didn't take too much of a lead and they let children evolve and do what they needed to do, mm. um, which a hundred years ago was a very interesting yes. concept. Yeah. And then there's Montessori. A lot of people know about Montessori mm. schools. Maria Montessori had a very specific method of education, um, including uh, the apparatus that was used, the, the equipment, she didn't call it toys, um, and uh, alongside people like Pestalozzi and Steiner, yeah. Waldorf Steiner schools, um, were all driven really by the basis, the fundamental pedagogical concepts that they felt were important. Yeah. And then, of course, the other end of the scale, we've got Summerhill and A.S. Yeah. Neal opening the school in 1921, um, where he determined there had to be no curriculum at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was the very basis of, of his idea of, of education. Mm -hmm. So there were some major developments in the first half of the 20th century. Um, many of them driven by, as I mentioned, the great Margaret Macmillan, um, free school meals, mm -hmm. medical examinations and treatment, dental inspections, the development of the first primary and secondary schools as we know them now, um, transition at age 11, the raising of the school leaving age, which was tied throughout really to um, changes in employment legislation. So right. children, I mean, at one stage we had things called half-timers mm -hmm. because they worked in the mills or the factories half-time <laughs> and then they went to school half-time. Mm -hmm. um, most of them, it seemed, fell asleep while they were there. But um, yeah, lots and lots of things that um, were brought in by changes in the rules, legislative changes. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then, of course, in 1961, Joy Baker won in court the right to educate her children at home without harassment, which I think is a very interesting term. Yeah. Um, and shortly after, John Holt publishes the first series of books, his first series of books, um, from 1964 onwards, um, based on what I think he created the concept of unschooling. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did. Um, and then finally in this, in 67, a government report children and their primary schools advocated what many people believe to be a new approach um, to curriculum, to education, which was based on a child-centred approach. Mm. Bridget Plowden is, um, was the chair of the committee um, and she's credited with uh, developing what we know today probably as progressive education. Um, and for a long time it wasn't very popular and there was mm. a great move against it although it draws on theories from people like Piaget and John Dewey and Vygotsky and there's a very strong basis for what Plowden tried to do mm. in terms of altering the concept of curriculum delivery in, in the primary sector. And, and there was some opposition to the content that may have led to the introduction of the national core curriculum? I would think, yeah, that seems to be what happened. There was such a reaction against these children all wandering around in primary classrooms, actually thinking for themselves and following their own directed learning, um, that we got this first um, baseline, I suppose, um, with the 1986 development. Um, and since then, for the last 25 years, the changes have continued. The GCSE replaced GCEs, mm. SATs came in in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, the first inspections by Ofsted in 1993, um, and then even more specific control through things like the Literacy Hour, the Numeracy Hour, mm. and the National Handbook um, curriculum handbook for primary teachers in 1999. Mm, creating more timetabling and sort of um, um, control over what was delivered, how and when, yeah. restricting um, that sort of more child-led play. And yet we still have a third of all children leaving school without the standard pass grade of four in English and maths, which would suggest that that kind of system is actually not working. I think it, it, it certainly raises challenges because, um, I mean, we'll all be familiar, my sister-in-law, for example, gave up teaching because mm. she felt that it robbed her of her ability to respond to the individual children, the mm. class that, th that she had at the time, and to be creative with the way she delivered mm. what she loved and believed in so much. Um, I'm sure she's not alone. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, it, it did... It did tie people down mm. more mm. Um, and the expectations seem to have continued to be uh, m more, to, to be stricter really in terms of what people have to deliver mm. um, for what we all know to be day to day to data. Mm. And it's interesting that that's in, in line with kind of offset inspections and, and things like that. The other major legislative change, I suppose, was the 1996 Education Act, which places a duty on parents to ensure that their child of compulsory school age receives suitable education. And it says either by regular attendance at school or otherwise. Um, but this, of course, can be fulfilled by home educating children. Mm. And, and the concept of what constitutes a suitable education is so tricky. Um, the terminology needs much more explanation and clarity. Mm. Mm. So we do plan to do another discussion where we can give that a bit more airtime. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, and then there's been even more change in terms of schooling and schools as opposed maybe to education. Um, because in 1999, the first city academies okay. were opened um, alongside private schools. Academies don't have to follow the national curriculum. No, and though in practice most of them do, 
Um, when my school became an academy, that was one of the reasons that, that, that drew us to uh, converting to be an academy, to have that flexibility to do what we felt was best for the children um, and to always have the child at the centre of what we did and taught. But the problem, you know, that I experienced was higher up with the kind of the threat of Ofsted and that's how it felt um, for me anyway, and the sort of specific requirements of the inspection on the school. In my opinion, um, you know, it's sort of, it, it, you've got the freedom to follow the national curriculum, but then on the other side, you're going to be having an, an, an inspection with very specific um, criteria to meet. Mm. And that sort of leads to, I think, a fear within mm. um, quite wonderful head teachers to be able to do and deliver what they actually think is right. So there's this, this, there's this freedom on one side, and on the other side, there's this sort of rigidity around mm -hmm. um, what you're going to be judged on. Um, and I think, I think that's really kind of why schools mm. don't deliver a more um, child-led curriculum. Mm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that that may be the reason that um, various other initiatives have recently been spawned, or relatively recently. Um, for example, the Royal Society of Arts set up a project which resulted in a report called Opening Minds. And that was a very interesting initiative, and it proposed a whole new kind of curriculum, competence-led or skills-led, as opposed to subject Mm -hmm. led um, with the fundamental change recommended in terms of the relationship between teachers and learners mm -hmm. um, because they say to quote schooling was no longer delivering the goods mm -hmm. um, it also proposed the need to listen to young people as customers of education mm -hmm. which we think don't we is probably the first time that mm -hmm. that terminology has been used um, and it quoted from a survey by the Industrial Society, a um, huge piece of work which showed that young people felt that their schooling should prepare them for the future, but is failing to do so. Mm, yeah, and so, so academies have brought a major shift away from local education authorities, now known as local authorities, um, running schools. Yes, that's... Uh, I don't know whether people actually realise quite how enormous that change really was, because every every local authority had an education department. Yeah. Um, the vast majority had architects departments and, mm. and a whole structure that delivered not only the schools and the school buildings and the facilities generally, but actually were responsible for monitoring supporting, mm. training, mm. Um, in terms of curriculum delivery. So very, very big change. I mean, in terms of, in addition to academies, um, in 2011, there was the first free school, yes. or the first free school in many centuries anyway. Mm. Um, and this idea was developed by the government. Uh, apparently, it was designed to encourage new school providers there was a lot of emphasis on parental involvement mm. uh, in in these initiatives and and innovation in terms of curriculum delivery um, by 2020 there were 557 free schools out of a total of 24,000 mm -hmm. schools yeah. um, with the further 229 that was still in the pipeline and they are still being um, developed today um, they referred to in the early uh, documentation as innovator schools, mm. which, given what you just said about, you know, people having the freedom with the curriculum but still feeling very constrained yeah. by Ofsted's inspection requirements, um, they were tasked with developing novel approaches to curriculum delivery and ethos. Um, and we're supposed to have a lot more freedom and flexibility. Um, whether that's actually what's happening, I'm not sure. No. Um, so last year, 2022, there were more pupils in academies and free schools than in local authority maintained schools. Yeah. 
Um, and also, interestingly, an increase in the number of children attending independent fee-paying schools. Mm. Um, quite significant numbers, actually. Wow. Um, and there have been, have there recently been and continue to be other initiatives, not only in the UK, but worldwide, uh, with people asking, you know, what, what is the point of school? and whether their systems um, deliver what, what's needed for the 21st century. So what's been said there? Um, I suppose probably one of the most recent and significant uh, initiatives has been the Times Education Commission. Mm -hmm. um, they reported last year. Um, one of the things in it that absolutely fascinates me is that in 1976, the Secretary of State only had three actual powers over schools. Yeah. Oh, One of which was a requirement to approve the removal of air raid shelters. <laughs> um, now he or she has more than 2,500 <gasps> powers over schools. Wow, that's huge. It is. So needless to say, the report went on to suggest that the Department of Education has far too centralised an approach to everything um, and the education system generally is too rigid, mm. possibly because of that. Um, it claims a consensus, widespread consensus, about the need for a radical reshaping of our education system because it doesn't adequately prepare young people for either work or life and is increasingly seen, they say, as out of touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it concludes, this is a once in a generation chance to change course. Mm. There's an appetite to reform. The dedication of teachers is being undermined by a system that is not fit for purpose. This is the moment to reinvent education. Mm. And schools are perfectly placed to provide a wonderful, rich learning environment. Um, the, the late Sir Ken Robinson, he set out so wonderfully in his 2022 um, final book, Imagine If, um, suggesting that the concept of curriculum and subjects is flawed um, and that in order to meet the personal, cultural, economic and so social ch challenges, students actually needed eight core competencies, which he referred to as curiosity, creativity, criticism, cr criticism communication, collaboration, uh, compassion, composure and, and citizenship. And I love this concept because it really enables us to focus on the process of learning much more than the kind of national curriculum focusing on the outcomes. Um, and I guess that's why I created collage, you know, to capture um, learning within, you know, any any categories um, that suit the, the many different styles of education um, and to be able to see the power of the kind of personal learning journey of the child as an individual um, customer. Mm. Yeah, the, it's, it's clearly the Times report I'm sure has actually identified something really significant. Mm. This is an opportunity is. for change, um, particularly given that 1.7 million children are persistently absent from school in England. Um, never before has that figure been anything like as high. Uh, there's all sorts of discussions about what the figure actually is. There's been much controversy and discussion for years and years about what constitutes suitable education and suitable schooling, really. Yeah. Um, I don't think one system has ever suited everybody no. right through the history of the story of education in this country. No. Um, in a free country, that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting in that time of change that actually with the rising numbers of of children being persistently absent from school, there's also rising numbers of families choosing to home educate. So I think, um, you know, I think there's a very, there's a lot of change happening in the world of education. I'd like to end this podcast with a, with a quote from Gato. Whatever an education is, it should make us an individual, not a conformist.
It should furnish you with the original spirit with which to tackle the, biggest que the big questions. It should allow you to find values which will be your roadmap through life. It should make you spiritually rich, a person who loves whatever you are doing, whatever you are, whomever you are with. And it should teach you what is important, how to live and how to die. Huge thank you to you, Wendy, uh, for bringing your wealth of experience to this podcast. You, you just have such a deep knowledge and a huge library <laughs> of what has happened um, and, and what's been said and the theories over time. So really grateful for, a pleasure. for bringing really that good. along. Um, we, we have created an article um, expanding on these areas because as you'll appreciate, you could go quite deep into lots of different areas. And there are lots of people that we, didn't, we haven't talked about um, that are in the article. Um, so that, that also includes references and book lists that we've used. So please look at the show notes and um, link to the website if you would like to look at this in more detail. And if anyone's got any qu questions relating to this topic for us, um, or any aspects that you'd like us to go into more detail um, with. We will be looking into the sort of terminology around the suitable education. Um, so look out for that one in the future. Um, but let us know by emailing us at hello at collageapp.co.uk. Um, until next time, stay calm and keep listening to your customer.